uh, cutting them down was a big challenge. So overall, um, uh, gaps of uh, we found when we looked at um, uh, first we did per, uh, environmental scan of uh, a lot of quantum management system, LCMS, uh, OER, uh, OER repositories, um, and tools and um, module builders. We look at many of them, and um, and also we reviewed some um, automated instructional design systems which some of them are um, not maybe in use, but we were able to reach out to developers and actually uh, try some of their authoring tools. So overall gaps, we, um, we found that interoperability is the, uh, problematic in most of them, uh, personalization, um, analytics, ad uh, advising, instructional design, advising, technical advising, um, learning assessment, um, collaboration, um, accessibility, and universal design. That was the gaps in existing systems, what we looked at. So um, we interviewed, then we went to interview, um, and we interviewed 68 uh, novice people, which are faculty, most of them faculty members who are just new to online and digital uh, content development and uh, 71 expert users, which are instructional designer developers, so people from um, uh, typical DS, D, sorry, <laughs> distance education units, e-learning units. And we consulted with Charles Ridolo, um, um, Kurt Bonk, um, um, Sanjay, yeah, sorry, David Wiley, uh, and uh, Rajiv. So we got a lot of information and we had to, again, analyze it and put it together and compare with the data on, on our service. So again, the key findings were need on onboarding for instructors. This is what people are talking about. Uh, and instructors themselves talking about some onboarding tutorials, how to create open educational resources, so digital resources. Um, uh, great need for instructional design support, definitely. A uh, strong desire to, for easy collaboration. They don't know how to find it. Although lots of them, uh, I believe around 60%, and I have uh, um, information data if anyone interested, um, suggested that they would like to collaborate, but they don't know how to find collaborators. Um, and uh, everyone mentioned about the quality of open educational resources when we asked them if they would, would be interested to, to use open educational resources in their courses. So when we start looking at the module builder, we realized that module builder, we can't think about it without thinking about the bigger picture and, uh, and where it sits and uh, what environment we'll be talking about the bigger picture yeah so we start looking into that and um, uh, we understood that we need the system uh, flexible enough and uh, um, definitely uh, modular module design which David was talking about um, to help to create the platform which is flexible a platform where we can plug in uh, for example uh, if you want to develop the content, HTML content, there is a module for that. If we want to create a video, there is a module of that and whatever, and maybe some other uh, creative tools, but so we can plug them in because we can't anticipate what will happen through the years. Um, so we wanted the system where the professor can come, create HTML content, Plug in in a structured way we will help them to assist them with structuring their content module, um, uh, ability for them to quickly search through other open educational resources to find uh, what they are looking, what's similar to their topic, find any collaborators who are working on these topics, um, and um, basically they were asking 24/7 support of instructional designers. So at any point they want to get um, some feedback from instructional design. That's why we start uh, uh, thinking about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, gaining the data 
and building the data to support them um, and automate some of the support if possible. Um, we talked about the tracking uh, of the changes and the versioning, and uh, it is uh, um, it was one of the biggest questions. And we we have in the report some of the solutions, but I don't think that it's uh, um, uh, overall. Um, when I'm talking about the report, um, I think the report is a, it's a live uh, organ. So it actually will be probably, we will be building upon that. It might be not a complete as I wish to be uh, complete, but I don't think that it's easy to say that it's done. Um, and uh, definitely we will um, be suggesting to use re um, relation database, uh, which makes it flexible to output the content in various formats. So also, uh, I'm just looking, no, sorry. I didn't have a, just leave it. Uh, so another recommendations for uh, 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 identifying learning needs, um, module objectives and the competencies for module uh, for the module prior uh, um, to content creation. So we we basically take faculty through to identify some of the um, some of the um, student needs. So we can actually show them some of the samples or templates, instructional design templates, if they would like to choose to use them. Um, um, so there was the discussion, big discussion about ID templates, automated pedagogical guidelines, automated ID reviews. So at the end of the, when someone creates OER modules, it can be automation can still happen on the college, quality assurance on some of the, um, some of the points of quality assurance. Um, and real time chat, chat based instructional design definitely. Um, so, and the feature which I was already talking, collaboration, um, user to connect and communicate very easily and invite other faculty members. Um, accessibility, help with accessibility. If there is a system that says that something is not well done, should be done. I suggest also to add some copyright um, notification if something is, uh, needs to be done on copyright. And definitely um, about um, talking about responsive design ability to go across multiple devices. And documentation, I have documentation if anyone needs more information on the service. Okay, I think it's working. David, do you want to say something? Yeah, it's working. Does it sound good? Good.
I'll send you my slides, um, but I'll just give you an overview of what we're doing at eCampus Ontario because I think most people um, have heard of what we are, but they don't really understand the, the depth of the activity that we're engaged in. So we have 45 universities and colleges in Ontario, uh, all of whom have online learning programs. The portal for the province is one of the baseline systems that gives all our citizens access to the information and the capability to register in online courses, of which there are 16,000 listed on Ontario and over 700 programs. Really great search tool that we use so that they can dig in deeply, including filters for things like comes with an open textbook, has open entry, all of those kinds of things. But what we're really still lacking is the notion that if you're going to get into online learning seriously, you really have to rethink and rethink what the online learning experience should be like for most students. And one of the key strategies that we've decided to go after as a part of that process is to actually ask students and to work with students directly for a design lab experience to help us up our value proposition with respect to online learning. So one of the things we're communicating directly to our universities and colleges these days is that from this point forward, education and technology are linked. Like, there is no separation. Even if you're standing in front of a class doing some kind of face-to-face -face delivery, you really are calling upon electronic and technology-enabled resources to animate your class in some way. So what we're working on is upskilling our faculty, and we've decided on a strategy uh, based on a concept that was developed at the University of British Columbia called the Attributes of the 21st Century Educator. Six attributes that every educator in the 21st century should have. Teacher for learning, collaborator, scholar, technologist, experimenter, curator. And we've begun to build new resources online, three, uh, sorry, six three-hour self-instructional modules for faculty members to begin to immerse themselves in this way of thinking about how to use technology more effectively, how to become technologists themselves, how to network with colleagues, how to build collaboratively, and how to curate collections of learning materials that will be useful to their students. The other part of it is that we've experimented with a domain of one's own for every faculty member. So instead of having people have a professional portfolio, we're giving them their own domain on the internet to manage and teaching them how to set it up and manage that with the perspective that that is the real portfolio for the future for their students. And it's not just a blog. It's a domain. It could have content in it, collections of resources. We work with Alan Levine, cog dog of internet fame, to really put that idea together. Alan came up and we ran a three-day summer institute with uh, 30 faculty members from our 10 northern institutions to kind of pilot it in a boot camp model and see where the warts were. And now we're taking all that information and feedback we got from them and turning this into a generic white labeled site that's completely packaged and can go to any institution to rebrand themselves and use for their training of faculty. So all the resources are available in the raw text, image files, and all of the pieces that you need in separate collections, or you can just unpack our whole site slap your logo on it, and away you go. So we're really looking at upskilling, and upskilling is a big strategy for us for moving with faculty and moving them forward. The other strategy for us is rethinking. Rethinking in three areas. Rethinking learning resources, rethinking the learning experience, rethinking recognition of learning what we call micro-credentials sometimes, what we call badges other times, what we call co-curricular records, work integrated learning. All of these things are floating out there in the universe, but students rarely have a way of saying, I know how to do this in a way that makes a lot of sense to them. So the strategy we're following is 
what we're calling building the T-shaped student. So someone who has deep domain knowledge, but a broad set of skills in things that help them get employed or further their education or just make them better citizens. So that's kind of a strategy we're following around rethinking. In terms of learning resources, um, our government has invested a lot in this province in open education over the past year. So we've imported the BC campus uh, open textbook library. It now operates in Ontario and we're going to build onto it. One of the things we did recently was send a grant to Ryerson University to build an open publishing infrastructure for the province based on open source tools end to end. So WordPress with the Pressbooks plugin, DSpace as a repository in the middle, and search tools that allow us to do really intelligent searches and build collections of resources. One of the things we're working on with Pressbooks is what's called a book cloning tool that allows you to load up an existing open educational resource and quickly edit it by reordering chapters, taking things out, putting new stuff out in, and quickly publishing it to PDF, the web, Kindle, any kind of format you need, including EPUB 2, or 3, I should say. In terms of rethinking the learning experience for students, um, We've been building this concept, what we call the Student Experience Design Lab. It started last January with a studio that we invited about 30 students to, Chris, and began to build out some paper prototyping and ideas that they could take and then work with some vendors and others in the community to say, how could we build this into something real? And now we've kind of established this lab. It's a great idea, and we're working with Experiential learning is one of the themes because our government in Ontario has said that every student who leaves Ontario universities and colleges shall have a meaningful experiential learning opportunity. And for us that means it's impossible to do that with work study or practicums. There are just too many students. There has to be a technology enabled solution as a part of that process. So we're working with vendors too, like Ripen, that links faculty, students, and the work community to, for students to execute curricular projects in workplaces virtually and have them graded, and come back and be part of their course grade. It's a very cool idea. Our government is really focused on giving students on-demand learning opportunities. So. A week ago, we just signed a deal with LinkedIn, a three-year deal for free access to LinkedIn Learning, lynda.com, for every student, faculty member, uh, and staff member at every institution in the province. So we have unlimited access to tools like that as well. And finally, we're working with open badging. We have 10 badging pilots running in the province right now, five in the universities, five in the colleges. And we invested in a Finnish company that has a Canadian representative because they could give us software that we could install and manage right in Ontario and free us up from freedom of information and privacy issues, not have to host it on a US-based cloud, which is a big issue in Canada. And so, we have now got open badging infrastructure for the province. And we're trying to tie it to all of these things, like what would a collection of lynda.com resources look like as a badged experience? What would uh, a set of open resources look like in a, as a badged experience? The project management course that Wayne has pointed to is one of the things that we'd like to explore. So really what we're trying to do in Ontario is focus on students, focus on all dimensions of the student, and produce what we're trying to give every student is what we're calling a 3D CV. They're gonna be great in the domains of knowledge and really good in the practical skills that allow them to get employed, further their education, or just be good neighbors and citizens. So that's the strategy we're pursuing. And we've been calling out to all kinds of people around Canada and North America for ideas. And we've started to put it together into a framework and a new strategic plan, which should be published 
publicly uh, when the so that's what we're doing. Very impressive, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. The slides are pretty. <laughs> I'll send them to you. Oh, I'm still mic'd. So there's a lot of heavy breathing going out over the airwaves. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Yeah. You just lost the projector for a while, and quickly my technical knowledge of this proprietary system uh, is going to help me. It's telling me it's got 33 seconds to power up, and we'll. Oh, we're back. Wonderful. So this, uh, this, uh, this will be pretty quick. Uh, what I'm basically wanting to do is just quickly check the issues for CEO's list and see if we've got anything there. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of issues that have been tabled so far. One, um, putting together an induction program uh, make it beneficial to everyone, not just new people. As a refresher, boom, okay. Clear and concise messages about OER, you, who, what, where, how, and how for members to speak briefly and champion pitch uh, brand guidelines. Okay. <laughs> Any other pressing issues or thoughts or decision proposals that came to mind during the, you know, the, the, the table conversations or the coffee breaks? that you feel need to be added on the list? Mark, just, could, could you come, it's just for the, sorry, yeah, yeah. This must be a Canadian mic, it doesn't it's pick up their thing, yeah. It's an Australian mic. Oh, even worse. We don't actually make mics anymore. I don't think so. I don't have to. Yeah, that's right. We're better. Um, now I've forgotten what I came up here for. Um, uh, yeah, so I was thinking that um, uh, that one of the, th the items I'd like to discuss here was whether or not OERU could provide any kind of support services, whether that's consulting or, or, or something like that, either to members or, or to others outside the, mem the network that might benefit from that. Um, you know, and some of the discussions we had as we were going uh, through some of the groups earlier had to do with the fact that we're all at different uh, places in our understanding of and uh, ability to implement uh, OER, and it seemed like uh, it might be nice for us to be able to draw upon uh, resources outside of our institutions, not, not just here at these meetings. Uh, you, whether that involves somebody from OER, um, OERU or from the OER Foundation actually working directly with an organization, uh, an institution, or whether it's pairing us up so that we can consult with each other. Uh, but I, So that may be more of a discussion point than a, than a CEO's uh, thing. But, but, uh, but it's good that we've uh, captured it. Uh, it I mean, I, my own gut feel, I mean, I think it's an excellent idea, and it's something we can certainly thrash out in the group here. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Mm. It must be getting tired. Uh, computer? See, my, my knowledge of the proprietary systems is improving. Any other issues? So what I'll do this evening, I'll also scan through some of the uh, reports and see if there are any issues that you know, sort of jump out and we'll add them to the list because tomorrow afternoon we also review this um, again um, because this is what then goes through.
to the CEO's meeting. Well, if you know other issues, I thank you kindly for your attention. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your contributions. I mean, these planning meetings are very important to us. And, you know, we get these drafts and they're the stepping stones for moving forward. So thank you very much. And we'll see you tomorrow. Cheers. Cheers.